as the title suggests, we're going to be looking at the animal phylum Arthropoda. Again, I've just kind of put this here to hopefully get you to remember and how to pronounce the proper term there. And you can see some species located within this phylum. Now what makes this particular phylum uh, unique is the advent of jointed appendages. Now this is the most successful of all the animal groups and these jointed appendages are one of the key um, distinguishing factors for this phylum. In addition to that there's also exoskeleton made of chitin. The muscles um, attach on the inside of this outer shell as we see here and that outer shell made of chitin protects against predators and also water loss. And we see that evident right here. It's a very hard type structure. Now chitin cannot support much weight so that results in a limiting of these individuals total size. Uh, they have segments and these three in particular that often fuse into functional groups when the animal reaches the adult stage. The three segments are the abdomen, the thorax, and the head. So these are also important to be able to identify on these particular animals. If we do dissections of or we want to refer to a specific region, these are the three regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen you should be familiar with. Now there's certain um, subsets within this phylum that lack jaws. Calistrate's one of those. And they just simply, they might have mouth parts, but they lack jaws. Uh, spiders, mites, scorpions, and horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs are interesting that we have fossil records going back about 630 million years ago. They're the only surviving type of this particular orthropoda. Th so they're found, again, they're not extremely rare, found in pretty high numbers along the um, beach in June in Long Island Sound is when they can come in and they tend to group together when they're um, mating. Uh, so that can be one to be seen. I also have one hanging on the wall as a preserved specimen. Now, this is not true for all um, Arthropoda. Some have actual mouth parts. We call those jaws properly termed mandibles. We see that in the human hair highlighted in green. We also see that in the ant hair. These insects, centipedes, millipedes have these mandibles, which are specialized mouth parts or jaws. Might be a little bit of a shocker of a slide, sorry for that, um, are arachnids. Uh, they have four pairs of walking legs, and then these two actually are not used for walking. These are just more for feeling, for gathering food items, for moving things, but not specifically for walking. So within the arachnid species, uh, there's about five about 57,000 named species within this. So we just classify them as spiders and kind of clump them in that category. Well, there's ticks and mites and daddy long legs and scorpions and spiders all lumped into this um, same group of arachnids. Within these arachnids, uh, there's among the first to live on land, going from water to air breathing. Scorpions are thought to be one of the first to make that transition from the water environment to the land environment. The reason is their lungs have a strong resemblance of king crab gills, particularly something called the book lung. You see that here. If you've ever um, opened the shell of a crab, you see the lungs or gills really here. Um, it's very similar to the king crab's gills and match the lungs of a scorpion. The lungs are specific called book lungs. They're called book because they kind of look like the pages of a book. This is creating a high surface area, allowing efficient exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. These crustaceans comprise of a diverse group of mandibles, about 35,000 species, such as crab, shrimp, lobster, crayfish, and pill bugs. You can see some can be really small, and some can be quite large. And they're all under this same general classification here. But we can see the diversity that does exist. Now, most crustaceans have two pairs of antennae, three pairs of chewing appendages, and various number of legs. You may re remember from one of my previous videos the importance of knowing your orientation. The dorsal view is looking kind of from the top down here, the back of the animal. The ventral is that underside of that belly region, and here's the side view. I'm not going to require you to know all the individual uh, segments here, but again, could be advantageous for identification purposes if we do a dissection of a crustacean. Crustaceans, just living in uh, New England, I want to point out some key um, items here with our lobster. We may think of a lobster in New England, the Maine or American lobster here with its large claws. For most of the world, though, the Caribbean or spiny lobster is what most people think of when they hear the term lobster. 
So what makes the Maine or American lobster so um, desired all over the world is its large claws, the meat in its claws. You can see the Caribbean or spiny lobster has a good tail meat region, but not really anything great in the claw region. Millipedes and centipedes, I just want to highlight some differences between these two. Millipedes and centipedes have bodies that consist of hard uh, head regions, I'm sorry, followed by numerous segments. So here's our centipede and here's our millipede. We notice immediately there's some very key differences between the two, and being able to identify the difference between the two is important. So let's go over some of the key things to look for. Centipedes have one pair of legs per segment, while millipedes have two legs per segment. Also, centipedes tend to be carnivorous, meaning they eat, um, in this case, this one's eating, sadly, a mouse that, that caught in the trap. Millipedes are herbivores, and they eat, I mean, they eat plants. So if you ever have the option, if you want to be put into a tank of millipedes or centipedes, despite the more legs, I'd go with the millipedes because they're going to be looking for a plant to eat and not want to take a bite out of you, like a centipede may. Lastly, we have our insects. This is the largest group. They are the most abundant eukaryotes on Earth. And insects have those three distinctive regions that I talked about, the abdomen, the thorax, and the head. And they're the most diverse. This is what makes the reason why this particular phylum is considered to be the most successful if you're looking at number of species, simply because of insects are the most abundant eukaryotes on Earth.